1948, Union Pacific's executives sat in their Omaha headquarters, staring at a problem that was bankrupting the railroad one trainload at a time. Sherman Hill, a seven-mile scar of granite cutting through Wyoming between Cheyenne and Buford, had become an industrial choke point that no amount of traditional engineering could solve. The westbound grade climbed at 1.55%, a number that sounds gentle until you're trying to drag 5,000 tons of steel, coal, and freight up a mountain that doesn't care about your schedule or your profit margins. The post-war economic boom had exploded freight volumes by over 50% in a single year. Rail yards from Council Bluffs to Ogden were drowning in boxcars, tankers, and hoppers waiting for their turn to climb the hill. Union Pacific's legendary big boy steam locomotives could muscle their way over the summit, but the cost was crushing. Mountains of coal burned per trip. Maintenance cycles measured in days, not weeks. Crews working triple shifts just to keep the giants moving. The accountants calculated that running a single big boy over Sherman Hill cost the railroad north of half a million dollars annually in fuel, water, and labor alone. The diesel revolution was supposed to fix everything. Electromotive and General Electric had promised railroads that their new diesel-electric locomotives would eliminate the coal expense slash maintenance costs and modernize the industry overnight. But on Sherman Hill, diesel power revealed a different kind of nightmare. Each EMDF unit produced just 1,500 horsepower. To move a heavy westbound freight train up that relentless grade required lashing together four, five, sometimes six diesel units in a single consist. That meant six separate engines to fuel at every stop, six sets of traction motors to inspect, six cooling systems to monitor, six potential failure points that could strand an entire train halfway up the climb with nowhere to go. The operational bottleneck was strangling Union Pacific's expansion plans. Dispatchers juggled schedules like combat logistics, moving trains through narrow windows and praying nothing broke down. Every delay cascaded through the system. Every stalled train meant missed connections in Ogden, angry customers in California, and revenue evaporating into the mountain air. The railroad's senior leadership, hard men who'd built careers solving impossible problems, faced a reality that traditional solutions couldn't touch. President William Jeffers and his chief mechanical officer Otto Jabelman weren't interested in incremental improvements. They wanted a revolution. Board minutes from late 1948 captured the mandate with brutal clarity. Find a single locomotive powerful enough to replace an entire fleet of diesels. Build a machine with enough raw force to climb Sherman Hill alone. Without helpers, without lash-ups, without excuses. The specifications bordered on fantasy. 8,000 horsepower. Continuous heavy haul capability fuel costs lower than diesel. Maintenance intervals measured in months, not days. The railroad industry thought Union Pacific had lost its mind, but desperation and vision make strange partners. And in a General Electric laboratory in Schenectady, New York, an engineer named Vincent Mertz was about to prove that the future of railroading didn't look like a locomotive at all. It looked like a fighter jet. Mertz wasn't a railroad man. His background was in aviation turbines, the screaming engines that powered America's newest jet fighters through the skies over Korea. While the rest of the locomotive industry obsessed over diesel refinement and incremental horsepower gains, Mertz stared at a gas turbine spinning at 7,000 revolutions per minute and saw something nobody else did. He saw the answer to Union Pacific's impossible problem. The physics were undeniable. A gas turbine operated on the Brayton thermodynamic cycle, air compressed to tremendous pressure, mixed with fuel, ignited in a continuous combustion chamber, then expanded through a turbine wheel to extract mechanical energy. Unlike a diesel engine, which relied on thousands of reciprocating parts, pistons slamming up and down, crankshafts twisting under impossible loads, valves opening and closing millions of times, a turbine had only a handful of rotating components. Air went in one end, exhaust came out the other. Everything in between spun in smooth, continuous rotation. The power density was staggering. Aviation engineers had calculated that turbines produced roughly 10 times more horsepower per pound than any diesel engine ever built. The F-86 Sabre jet fighter that dominated Korean skies generated thrust from a turbine weighing barely a thousand pounds. Scale that technology up to locomotive size, and the numbers became absurd. A single gas turbine could theoretically produce 8,500 horsepower, more than five standard diesel locomotives combined. But translating aviation technology to railroad operations meant solving problems that didn't exist at 30,000 feet. Aircraft turbines ran at sustained high power for hours at a time, cruising at optimal efficiency. Locomotives needed to idle in yards, throttle up and down through varying terrain, and deliver maximum torque at zero miles per hour when starting a heavy train from a dead stop. Turbines hated low-power operation. They consumed nearly as much fuel at idle as they did at full throttle. 
a characteristic that would later prove fatal. But in 1948, that problem seemed manageable compared to the promise of raw, overwhelming power. The engineering challenges were immense. Turbines spun so fast that any imbalance, any flaw in the turbine blades, could trigger catastrophic failure. The exhaust gases screamed out of the combustion chamber at temperatures exceeding 800 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to warp steel rails, scorch wooden ties, and ignite anything flammable within 50 feet and the sound. Engineers who witnessed early turbine tests described it as standing behind a commercial airliner at full takeoff thrust, except the noise never stopped. It was a constant bone-shaking roar that made conversation impossible and turned nearby buildings into residence chambers. Skeptics lined up to explain why the concept would fail. Turbines required exotic alloys to survive the thermal stress. The air intake would need protection from birds, debris, and Wyoming snowstorms. The electrical generator needed to convert turbine shaft power into traction. Motor electricity would be larger and heavier than anything ever mounted in a locomotive. Every conventional wisdom in railroad engineering said it couldn't work. Mertz and his team at General Electric didn't care about conventional wisdom. They built test rigs in Schenectady and ran turbines at full power for days, measuring vibration, testing materials, calculating fuel consumption at every load point. They designed massive air filters and protective screens. They engineered heavy-duty generators capable of handling 8,500 horsepower continuous output. They studied locomotive duty cycles and calculated that despite the turbine's poor fuel economy at low power, the savings from eliminating multiple diesel units would more than compensate. Union Pacific's leadership watched the development with a mixture of hope and skepticism. The financial pressure was building. Freight volumes kept climbing. Sherman Hill kept throttling capacity. The diesel lash-ups kept breaking down and burning money. If the turbine worked, if it actually delivered on Mertz's promises, it would transform the railroad overnight. If it failed, Union Pacific would own the most expensive industrial failure in American railroad history. In 1952, General Electric delivered the first prototype. Union Pacific gave it a designation that would stick for two decades, the Big Blow. The Big Blow wasn't a locomotive in any traditional sense. It was three separate units mechanically coupled together, stretching nearly 200 feet from the lead cab to the trailing fuel tender. The front unit housed the engineer's cab, a command center perched high above the rails with visibility stretching for miles down the Wyoming plains. The middle unit was the turbine car, a massive steel container holding the gas turbine engine, the electrical generator, and all the cooling and control systems needed to keep 8,500 horsepower from tearing itself apart. The rear unit was the fuel tender, and it told you everything you needed to know about how radically different this machine was from conventional locomotives. Instead of diesel fuel, the Big Blow burned Bunker C, a thick, viscous residue left at the bottom of oil refinery distillation towers. In the 1950s, Bunker C was considered industrial waste. Refineries couldn't crack it into gasoline or diesel. They couldn't use it for lubricants. It was too heavy, too dirty, and too troublesome for most applications. Ships burned it in their boilers because they had no choice. Railroads wanted nothing to do with it. But Union Pacific saw opportunity where everyone else saw garbage. Bunker C sold for approximately three cents per gallon in 1952, less than one-tenth the price of diesel fuel. The catch was that at ambient temperature, Bunker C had the consistency of cold tar. You couldn't pump it. You couldn't atomize it. You couldn't burn it. The fuel tender solved this with electric heating coils embedded in the tank walls, maintaining the Bunker C at 250 degrees Fahrenheit. At that temperature, the sludge turned liquid enough to flow through fuel lines to the turbine's combustion chamber. The tender carried 24,000 gallons. At full power climbing Sherman Hill, the big blow consumed roughly 250 gallons per hour. That gave the locomotive approximately 96 hours of continuous running time between refueling stops, far longer than any diesel could manage without multiple fuel stops. And at 3 cents per gallon, the fuel cost for a single run from Council Bluffs to Ogden was negligible, compared to running five diesels on premium fuel. The turbine itself was an engineering marvel wrapped in a deafening nightmare. The compressor section drew in massive volumes of air through protective screens designed to stop everything from tumbleweeds to birds. The air was compressed to pressures exceeding 100 pounds per square inch, then mixed with atomized bunker C in the combustion chamber. Ignition created a continuous fireball that heated the gases to over 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Those gases expanded through the turbine wheel, spinning it at 6,900 revolutions per minute. The turbine shaft drove an electrical generator that produced the electricity to power six massive traction motors, one for each driving axle. The sound was unlike anything railroading had ever produced. When the turbine fired up, 
the initial ignition created a deep rumble that quickly escalated into a high-pitched whine. As power increased, the whine became a scream, a constant, piercing shriek that carried for miles across the Wyoming landscape. Houses along the main line shook when the big blow passed. Windows rattled, dogs howled. People stopped conversations mid-sentence and waited for the turbine to pass before resuming. Inside the cab, engineers faced control systems that bore no resemblance to traditional locomotive throttles. Starting the turbine required a precise sequence. Prime the fuel system. Activate the heating coils. Bring the turbine to idle speed using an auxiliary starter motor. Monitor exhaust gas temperature as the combustion stabilized. Only then could the engineer begin advancing the power lever, feeding more fuel into the chamber and watching the horsepower gauge climb toward maximum output. The first time Union Pacific crews took a big blow up Sherman Hill at full throttle, every assumption about locomotive capability shattered. 100 loaded boxcars, roughly 5,000 tons of freight, accelerated up the westbound grade at 40 miles per hour. No helpers, no second section, no delays. The turbine screamed at full power, the exhaust stack glowing cherry red in the darkness, traction motors howling as they converted 8,500 horsepower into forward motion. Engineer Bill Price, who spent 15 years running turbines, described the experience in an interview decades later. You didn't operate that machine, he said. You managed it. You kept one eye on the temperature gauge, one eye on the track ahead, and you tried not to think about what would happen if something broke at that power level. When you opened the throttle on flat ground, the train would jerk forward so hard it could snap couplers if you weren't careful. On the hill, it just pulled. It didn't slow down. It didn't struggle. It pulled. The numbers backed up the experience. By 1958, Union Pacific was operating a fleet of turbines that, despite representing less than 2% of the railroad's total locomotive roster, hauled more than 10% of all freight tonnage. Each turbine averaged over 100,000 miles annually, distances that would cripple conventional diesels. The maintenance intervals were shockingly long. While diesels needed major overhauls every 18 months, turbines ran for years with only minor servicing. The operational impact was transformative. Sherman Hill, which had been the bottleneck throttling Union Pacific's expansion for decades, became just another grade. Dispatchers scheduled trains with confidence, knowing a single turbine could handle loads that previously required multiple units and helper engines. The railroad reclaimed hundreds of labor hours per month by eliminating helper operations. Fuel costs, despite the turbine's inefficiency at low power, plummeted because Bunker C was essentially free. For a brief moment in the late 1950s and early 1960s, Union Pacific's gamble looked like genius. The big blow had crushed every freight record. It had solved the Sherman Hill problem. It had proven that radical innovation could triumph over conventional engineering. Vincent Mertz's vision of bringing aviation power to the rails had been vindicated. But the victory was built on a foundation that was already beginning to crack. The turbine's Achilles heel was hiding in plain sight from the beginning. While diesels could idle quietly in rail yards consuming minimal fuel, the gas turbine was nearly as hungry sitting still as it was hauling freight at full power. The thermodynamic reality was unavoidable. The turbine needed to maintain minimum operating temperature and speed, which meant continuous fuel consumption regardless of load. Engineers joked darkly that parking a turbine at a red signal was like leaving a jet engine running on the tarmac. The fuel gauge kept dropping even when the wheels weren't turning. Union Pacific's operations department initially dismissed the concern. When Bunker C cost three cents per gallon, wasting fuel at idle was annoying but manageable. The savings from eliminating diesel lash-ups and helper engines more than covered the inefficiency. But the economic equation that made the turbines viable was already shifting in ways no one at Union Pacific anticipated. The petrochemical revolution of the 1960s rewrote the value of heavy oil overnight. Chemists discovered that the same thick, worthless residue that refineries had practically given away could be cracked into feedstock for plastics, synthetic materials, and industrial chemicals. Suddenly, Bunker C wasn't garbage anymore. It was raw material for an entirely new industry. The price began climbing in the early 1960s. By 1965, it had doubled. By 1969, Bunker C cost nearly as much per gallon as diesel fuel. The financial calculations that had justified the turbine program evaporated. Internal memos from Union Pacific's accounting department in 1967 and 1968 painted a grim picture. Turbine operating costs had more than doubled in less than a decade. 
The fuel advantage that had made the entire experiment economically viable was gone. When you factored in maintenance, which, while less frequent than diesel, was far more expensive when it did occur, the turbines were now costing the railroad almost twice as much per mile as conventional diesel consists. President John Kennefick, who took control of Union Pacific in 1970, was a numbers man with no sentimental attachment to engineering experiments. He ordered a comprehensive cost-benefit analysis. The results were unambiguous. Keep running the turbines and the railroad would hemorrhage cash. The break-even point had vanished with cheap bunker C. Every mile a turbine operated was now money thrown away. But fuel economics weren't the only pressure building against the turbines. The noise that had once been a symbol of raw power was becoming a political liability. As suburbs sprawled along Union Pacific's main line through Wyoming and Nebraska, residential communities found themselves living next to what sounded like a permanent jet engine test facility. The turbine scream carried for miles, rattling windows and making sleep impossible for anyone within earshot of the tracks. Town council meetings in Cheyenne, Rollins, and Laramie filled with angry residents demanding relief. There were no formal noise ordinances written specifically to ban the turbines, but the political message was unmistakable. Local governments made it clear that continued turbine operations would face regulatory resistance. Union Pacific quietly began routing turbines away from populated areas parking them in remote sidings during crew changes and refueling stops. But that strategy only made the fuel inefficiency worse. Every hour a turbine sat idling in the middle of nowhere was money burned for zero operational benefit. By 1969, Union Pacific's board made the decision. The turbine program would be phased out. No new orders. No further development. The existing fleet would run until maintenance costs made them uneconomical, then they'd be withdrawn from service. The turbines that had once represented the future of railroading were now seen as expensive relics of a failed experiment. The last big blow ran in revenue service in 1970. By 1979, every turbine had been cut up for scrap. Their massive generators were sold to industrial facilities. The turbine engines, those screaming powerhouses that had once pulled trains up Sherman Hill with contemptuous ease, were dismantled and melted down. A few components survived in museums as curiosities, Mechanical oddities that represented a brief moment when American railroading dared to think like the aviation industry. The irony was brutal. The turbines didn't fail because they couldn't do the job. They failed because the economic environment that justified their existence evaporated faster than Union Pacific could adapt. The petrochemical industry's discovery of value in heavy oil destroyed the fuel cost advantage. The expansion of suburban development along rail corridors made the noise politically untenable and the relentless improvement in diesel-electric technology, higher horsepower ratings, better fuel efficiency, modular designs that allowed easy lash-ups, eliminated the operational gaps that turbines had filled. Vincent Mertz's vision had been correct. You could bring aviation power to the rails. You could build a locomotive that crushed every performance metric. You could solve problems that conventional engineering couldn't touch, but you couldn't outrun economics. You couldn't ignore political pressure and you couldn't build a business model on fuel that the rest of the world suddenly wanted. Today, railroads chase efficiency, measured in fractions of a percent. Modern locomotives are marvels of computer control and emissions compliance, delivering reliable power with minimal environmental impact. The industry solved Sherman Hill decades ago with AC traction technology and microprocessor-controlled wheel slip systems. No one needs 8,500 horsepower in a single unit anymore. Distributed power and remote operation make the old problems irrelevant. But the questions the turbines raised never really went away. As global freight volumes surge and energy sources shift toward hydrogen and battery electric power, the railroad industry faces pressure to innovate again. The demands for raw, disruptive power haven't disappeared. They've just been sleeping, waiting for the next engineer crazy enough to look at conventional wisdom and decide the answer lies somewhere else entirely. Progress has never been quiet. Sometimes it shakes the ground. Sometimes it screams loud enough to rattle windows for miles. The big blow proved that American engineering could build anything if the stakes were high enough. Whether we'll ever dare to build something like it again remains an open question. The turbine era ended not with triumph, but with a quiet retreat into history. The machines that crushed every freight record ever set were cut apart in rail yards. Their screaming engines silenced forever. But they left behind a lesson that every railroad executive should remember. Sometimes the future is loud, sometimes it's terrifying, and sometimes it works exactly as promised until the world changes and stops caring.